Picture a crew circling the red planet during the Carter administration. Not in fantasy tales, but inside repurposed spacecraft from the Moon program propelled by boosters already manufactured. The equipment was constructed. The crews were preparing. The operational blueprints were finalized. This was reality. It was NASA's extended Apollo initiative, and it missed transforming our timeline by mere funding decisions. By the early 70s, the agency possessed the launch vehicles. They possessed orbital facilities. They possessed operational strategies for reaching Mars with existing hardware stored in facilities and positioned at launch sites nationwide. Yet these ventures remained grounded. The boosters were broken down. The aspirations were abandoned and a vast enterprise founded on lunar success disappeared before reaching its potential. This chronicles NASA's abandoned pathway, where the real question becomes not whether the capability existed, but what caused the cancellation. The explanation exposes something more troubling about our collective drive than any technical setback possibly could. During the mid-60s, while lunar missions remained years from completion, the agency was designing subsequent objectives. The Apollo Extension Initiative wasn't about repeating lunar landings. It involved converting Apollo's boosters, vessels, and systems into something considerably more ambitious, sustained human operations in orbit and farther out. Within storage buildings at Marshall, Von Braun surveyed Saturn components surrounding him, enormous thrust chambers, propellant containers matching agricultural storage structures in scale. This represented his career's culmination bearing fruit. Beyond simply touching the lunar surface, it meant leveraging that accomplishment as foundation for solar system exploration. The Saturn stood 360 feet tall, exceeding Liberty's statue in height. It possessed capability for lifting 260,000 pounds toward low orbit, equivalent to four dozen mature elephants propelled past atmospheric boundaries within eight minutes. These represented completed hardware, not preliminary designs. Two dozen Saturn vehicles existed in finished or advancing production states. Each constituted controlled detonation, generating chest vibrations detectable from three miles distant. Armstrong touched down in summer 69. Within months afterward, the agency unveiled comprehensive strategies for over 20 additional Apollo ventures, targeting destinations beyond lunar surfaces. Orbital facilities supporting months-long crew stays lunar installations enabling extended surface operations, Venus encounters exploiting gravity trajectories, and Martian missions aligned with departure opportunities throughout 75, 76, and 77. A Martian flyby during the late 70s was achievable, a 600 to 900 day expedition utilizing production hardware with initial crew evaluations underway. Not someday, not perhaps, but within 10 years, Yet as the agency briefed Congress in late 69, initial warnings emerged. Vietnam consumed 28 billion yearly from national accounts. Public fascination with orbital operations, which peaked during Armstrong's initial step, was declining. Broadcasting networks abandoned complete coverage of subsequent lunar expeditions. Muller, heading manned flight operations, confronted an unsolvable equation in 68. Projected allocations trended downward. His approach was radical enough to alarm engineers. Rather than constructing new orbital facilities from nothing, modify the boosters directly. The fueled workshop approach sounds fever dream inspired. Launch a Saturn upper stage carrying complete propellant load. Consume that propellant reaching orbit. Subsequently send crews later for converting the depleted tank toward habitation. The tank measured 118 feet long, containing 320 cubic meters of usable interior volume, approximately matching a substantial three-bedroom residence already orbital, already funded through launch operations itself. Picture constructing a vessel inside an enormous bottle, except the bottle spans 60 feet. You're operating in weightlessness, and any lingering fuel vapors prove lethal within minutes. Following propellant consumption, crews would arrive days afterward. They'd penetrate tank surfaces for venting residual propellant, liquid hydrogen boiling at negative 423 Fahrenheit. Subsequently, they'd enter this metal cylinder, decontaminate interiors of toxic remnants, and establish floors, partitions, environmental controls, and research facilities entirely in vacuum conditions, entirely while. 
circling Earth at 17,500 miles hourly. The hazards were substantial. Liquid hydrogen remains invisible, without odor, and explosively combustible. Even minimal quantities mixing with oxygen generate explosive potential. The tank's aluminum construction was minimal, engineered for containing fuel during ascent, not serving as extended habitat. A sand particle traveling at 70,000 miles hourly carries kinetic force matching a projectile. NASA selected an option, protection over productivity. The outfitted workshop over the fueled version launched the facility already equipped using complete Saturn capability for lifting it finished. That determination would produce Skylab, but would equally consume Saturn boosters, potentially launching interplanetary ventures. During mid-May 73, the final Saturn destined for flight departed Kennedy. Its cargo was Skylab, 118 feet of modified booster stage converted toward America's initial orbital facility, containing 12,000 cubic feet of habitation area, exceeding a three-bedroom residence. 63 seconds into ascent, catastrophe occurred. The debris shield activated prematurely. The atmospheric forces at 36,000 feet stripped it loose, removing one primary solar wing and blocking the remaining against the structure. Skylab achieved orbit damaged, overheating, and energy depleted. Eleven days following, the initial crew, Conrad, Kerwin, and Whites, launched on salvage operations. They transported improvised equipment, a parasol thermal barrier assembled within days, cutting implements and determination. During a critical extravehicular operation, they released the blocked solar wing and positioned the thermal barrier. Skylab's interior temperature decreased from 130 Fahrenheit toward habitable 75. The facility was rescued. This exemplified precisely the flexibility and creative resolution that a 600-day Martian journey would require, and the crew demonstrated feasibility. Across three missions spanning 171 days, crews accomplished revolutionary research. The Solar Telescope transmitted imagery of solar eruptions and plasma discharges, massive plasma explosions exceeding Earth's dimensions. They confirmed humans could survive orbital conditions for 84 continuous days. They examined how skeletal structure lost minerals in weightlessness, how muscular systems weakened, how circulatory functions adjusted. Every physiological measurement provided information essential for planning missions spanning years, not days. Yet as the third crew performed their investigations during early 74, a devastating reality was emerging. Skylab was isolated. The initial strategy envisioned multiple orbital facilities, a lunar orbit station, deep space construction platforms where interplanetary vessels would be assembled from elements launched on Saturn boosters. Instead, just one facility orbited in solitude. By 74, the remaining Saturn boosters were being retired. Three of them, complete flight-capable vehicles, were positioned in exhibition spaces as memorials to a program concluding almost before starting. While those three crews orbited Earth, other astronauts were preparing for missions that would transform what human meant. They weren't rehearsing lunar activities. They were examining Martian geology, Venusian atmospheric science, the medical procedures for deep space. Their departure dates continually delayed. 75 became 76. 76 became 77. Then the dates vanished completely. The Martian flyby wasn't speculative thinking. It was engineering. 140 to 150 metric tons constructed in low orbit from multiple Saturn launches. Journey duration 600 to 900 days, approaching two years sealed within a vessel matching a modest residence. Departure opportunities were calculated. 75, 76, 77. These weren't distant fantasies. These were missions with calendar dates, with crews designated, with components under fabrication. Skeptics maintained that dispatching humans toward Mars during the 70s was fatal. The radiation exposure alone would prove lethal. NASA's technical staff held contrasting perspectives. These were technical challenges, and technical challenges possess solutions. Beyond Earth's shielding magnetosphere, Cosmic radiation and solar eruptions presented genuine threats. Yet engineers had identified materials providing protection. Water and polyethylene selected for hydrogen content. 
Hydrogen atoms excel at intercepting energetic particles, superior to lead, superior to steel. The Martian flyby vessel designs. Incorporated dedicated radiation protection. Reinforced sections lined with water containers where crews could shelter during solar events. A 600-day mission couldn't simply transport oxygen and water for complete duration. A single human requires approximately 1.8 pounds of oxygen and 8 pounds of water daily. Multiply by 6 crew and 900 days, and you're considering over 50,000 pounds of consumables alone. So engineers created closed cycle systems regenerating oxygen through electrolysis, water recovery systems, including waste reclamation. The technology was validated in facility testing. The components existed. The engineering was viable. It simply required funding for completing development. By 70, the trajectory was evident. The extended program was being eliminated. Not because engineering failed, not because missions were unachievable, but because America decided it finished funding tomorrow. Vietnam peaked at 28 billion yearly, nearly six times NASA's complete allocation. Following Apollo 11, public engagement with orbital operations collapsed. Broadcasting networks ceased airing lunar landings during peak viewing. Surveys indicated most Americans believed orbital spending deserved reduction. Apollo was presented as competition against Soviets. But once victorious, no persuasive rationale remained for continuing. The extended program's scientific and exploratory objectives establishing sustained human operations beyond Earth, demonstrating capability for becoming interplanetary, couldn't rival immediate terrestrial priorities. Astronauts who prepared for missions never occurring watched their departure dates disappear into administrative emptiness. Muller departed NASA in 69. Von Braun left in 72 before Skylab launched, recognizing that political commitment toward his vision had vanished. The painful contradiction haunts us today. Many technologies the extended program would have pioneered, extended duration environmental systems, orbital construction, deep space navigation, required painful redevelopment decades afterward for the International Station. We're addressing identical challenges currently that we could have resolved during the 70s. Half a century of advancement lost to vision failure. Multiple backup Saturn and intermediate boosters remained completed in storage waiting for missions never arriving. Eventually, they were positioned horizontally in exhibition spaces, monuments toward capability without direction. During mid-July 79, Skylab incinerated an Earth's atmosphere, streaking across skies in a spectacular display of fragmenting metal and unrealized aspirations. This occurred within the time frame when astronauts could have been passing Mars had funding persisted, had vision endured. The Apollo Extension Program represents history's significant lost chances. Not because technology failed, but because we failed maintaining vision. We're capable of remarkable achievements when driven by rivalry, by anxiety, by requirements for demonstrating dominance. Yet we struggle sustaining exploration for exploration's purpose. The equipment existed. Three Saturn boosters occupy exhibition spaces currently, never flown, each capable of lifting sufficient mass for beginning Martian spacecraft assembly in orbit. The astronauts were prepared. The mission strategies were detailed down to velocity calculations. We didn't lack technology, we lacked commitment. The obstacles toward becoming interplanetary aren't primarily technical. They're political, financial, ideological. They concern what we prioritize, what we'll invest toward, what tomorrow we believe merits constructing. In an alternative timeline, one diverging from ours by nothing beyond political decisions and funding choices, humans reached Mars during the late 70s. We don't inhabit that timeline. We inhabit this one where the Enterprise was dismantled, where the boosters were positioned in exhibition spaces, where the aspirations were abandoned. We could have become an interplanetary species by the 80s. We elected otherwise. And that election defines the heritage of NASA's vanished Enterprise. The question haunting us isn't whether capability existed, it's what caused the cancellation. The explanation is that we prioritized other matters more. Not because those matters were more significant in any universal sense, but because they seemed more immediate, more pressing, more connected toward present concerns rather than distant future possibilities. 
The Apollo Extension Program stands as testament to human capability and human constraint. We reached toward Mars and came short. Not because the distance was excessive, but because we released too. Early. The boosters occupy exhibition spaces now. The aspirations are preserved, but the possibility persists, awaiting the moment when we elect to reach again, to construct again, to trust again, that tomorrow beyond Earth merits the expense of arriving there. If you enjoyed this story, hit subscribe for more content where history, technology, and human drive intersect. Thanks for watching.